We are honored this morning to have Dr. Pell Coupe, who will be leading us on that discussion or sharing her thoughts with us. And then after that, we may pose questions. Uh, this will be a live physical session. She's here with us in, in, in physically. Uh, Dr. Pell Coupe is an attorney who specializes in labor law matters and rights. Uh, she is the best-selling author and a former TV host. She is an activist, and I think that's how she'd love to be uh, known as, as the king of activists, as she, she refers herself. At heart, who is passionate about Africa and dealing with a lot of several issues, uh, like transformational leadership, the good governance, active citizenry, people empowerment, community transformation, and nation building, to list just a few. Dr. Kupe is a former social dialogue specialist with the International Labour Organization, the ILO, and the first appointed registrar of the Botswana Industrial Labour Court. She sits on many international boards, including but not limited to ACT International Council Board and Crans Montana Honorary Executive Committee for African Women Leaders. She is a senior fellow at Geneva Institute of Leadership and Public Policy, founder and the international president of the Global Forum for Women Entrepreneurs. She is privileged to be the recipient of multiple awards, including African Women Legacy Award, the SADC Pioneering Women, and SA Influential Women Award in 2019. She is a kingdom activist, as I said, who uses her professional training to further the kingdom and the agenda and the mandate. I spoke to her and said, we have to chop your CV because I'll take your 45 minutes just by introducing him. <laughs> Please, colleagues, join me as we welcome Dr. Pell Coupe on stage. Thank you so much, uh, the disciple. Most important thing, um, which I'm sure is common with all of you, is that she loves Jesus. Yes. So that really is, is, is what forms who I am in terms of identity. In him, I live and move and have my being, and that's probably the most important thing that you need to know about me. But uh, what a privilege and an honor to be talking to all of you. I'm very passionate about um, this aspect of the media, taking the media gate, and it is a real honor to be sharing with you some ideas and exchanging some ideas, because uh, I won't sit here and think I'm the only one with ideas. I'm sure I would love to hear from you um, in the last 15 minutes. And also see, I see this as a time of networking and mobilizing, bringing our resources together, having a game plan and a strategy for going forward. One of the things that irks me about the believers as the body of Christ is we tend to be reactive. And I believe God is calling us to be responsive and not reactive. Reactive implies emotionalism. It implies a lack of strategy. But when you respond, you respond, first of all, you're led by the Spirit of God. Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God shall be called sons of God. But also there's something very strategic about what we do. And one thing I learned is that God is strategic. If you look and read in Genesis, he was very purposeful, intentional, and strategic around how he created the world. Let there be. He planned, he implemented, he monitored, he reviewed, he evaluated. He said, let there be. And then he implemented. And then he monitored and he said it was good. And then he evaluated everything and he said it was very good. He was intentional about what we do. And I believe as the body of Christ, we need to be intentional in this season about what we do. And I want us to be intentional about taking the media gate in this season, the media gate. So we're just going to go through a little bit around talking a little bit about the battle 
because I do believe there's a battle going on out there. It'll take us to the information war. The battle is essentially around an information war. What is that information war? And then we'll look at some aspects around controlling, how to control, what is the solution in terms of setting the narrative? What kind of narrative must we actually set? A new narrative, but it must also be a truthful narrative and it must be an empowering narrative as well. So those are some of the things that we're, I think we're gonna focus on today um, in the time that we're given. All right, how do I? Okay, there we go. All right, so the battle. I think we all agree that there is some sort of battle going out there. There's a battle for control. If you've been watching the happenings globally, what's happening out there is that there's definitely a battle for control. And uh, as a lawyer, as somebody who God has raised up as an attorney and a lawyer, I understand that one of the ways that they try to control the nations and the conduct of the people is through legislation. So if you have been paying close attention, you will see that laws are being changed and they're being changed to do what? To control our conduct, to control our behavior, you and I would have seen during this lockdown how much legislation can control and decide what you and I can do or cannot do. So there's a battle for control and the arm of law is really one of the tools that's being used to control our behavior, to decide what we can and cannot do. And one of the things that has been going on for the last 15, 20 years, as I call myself as an activist, is that in that control, Many nations and leaders around the nations are trying to legislate criminality or immorality, maybe is the better way I should say. Legislate immorality. Right now, the next battle we're going through, which is going to Parliament soon, is the, the attempt to le legalize prostitution. So, and this was done, I think, 10 years ago. We were fighting against it again, where there were companies and organizations like Sweat, you know, sex workers advocacy group wanting to legalize prostitution. And, and it just doesn't make sense, the reason why they want to legalize it. They're saying that no, because prostitutes are being beaten up and you know, all of that. So they want prostitutes to be afforded dignity. So how do you afford dignity with such a profession to somebody? A, a profession that opens somebody up to all sorts of STDs, to HIV, um, AIDS, etc. How will you say that that's affording somebody dignity? Instead of looking for a reasonable job that would really afford somebody dignity, now you say you want to legalize it so that they can be afforded dignity. But this is just an example that I'm throwing out there. So there's a global trend out there to legalize immorality and to criminalize morality. That's why you will find laws out there like the hate speech bill, like Peputa bill, pro prevention, promotion of equality and prevention of unfair discrimination that are out there to silence the church. That scriptures will now be defined as hate speech because once you silence that, that body that has been assigned as a, as a, as a benchmark, as salt, that body that has been, you know, set out there to say, you are the salt, you must bring the flavor, you are the light, you must show direction. Once you silence them, then it opens a, a whole doorway into immorality. And so I'm just setting this as a foundation because, of course, you as the media are a part that must understand this, that overall attempt to legalize immorality and to criminalize morality. That means a part of your battle is understanding this and making sure that you stand on a narrative that now stands for righteousness and justice. And we will go into that later, but like I said, there's a battle for the control of nations around the world. And the, the theme is recalibrate, recalibrate. So there's a, an, a, a, an attempt to recalibrate because God is the creator is the original one. He has already set forth a blueprint. He's already set forth a, a direction for the nations. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it thereof, says Psalms 24.1. There is a redemptive purpose and agenda for every nation. But out there, we see 
an attempt to recalibrate, change, reset the agenda. Uh, organizations like WEF, and mind you, I'm speaking as somebody who worked for one of those organizations, United Nations. So when I talk about organizations, I know what I'm saying. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about as somebody who's worked in the system and not understands the agenda of the system. Like Moses. Moses was in Egypt not to align with Egypt, but to understand the systems. Because you cannot confront a system that you do not understand. When you understand it from within, you know the weaknesses of the system. Yep. So God called him out of Egypt to say you are not an Egyptian, but you are an Israelite. And then he cleaned him up, took him to the back side of the mountain, cleaned him up, got him mentored by Jethro, and then sent him back to confront that system that he knew intimately. Yeah. And so we must understand that, that we are not a part of that system. So we don't make a mistake and start to align ourselves with a system, Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. And that's my prayer, that as people who are operating in the media gate, we will not conform to the system of the world, but we will remain resolute, immovable, and unshakable in our stance for the kingdom of God. And so that, that is my testimony, understanding the system, that I'm not to conform to the system, but God allowed me in the system, like Daniel was in Babylon, but not conforming. He said, you can sit in Babylon, but not to eat of the meat, not to comprise, co co compromise your values, but sitting, are we supposed to be in Babylon? Yes, how else will you influence Babylon? If you're outside. How else will you influence Egypt? If you're on the inside, if you're on the outside. We influence from being in, but not of. That's, that's the distinction. You can be in, but not part of. So as salt, you see, salt goes into the meat. Its flavor is felt. Salt can go into a dish. It can take on the color. If you add turmeric to salt, it can turn yellow. But it doesn't change its substance and content. That's who we are. We are salt to go in. We can change our dress. We can change our hairstyles. And I don't know the woman said hallelujah. <laughs> We can change things that pertain to our external, but our internal, the DNA of who we are, must not change. The substance of who we are must not change. We must be the influencers out there. God said if salt is not doing its job, then it just needs to be tossed out. So there's a battle. There's leaders and governments out there trying to recalibrate nations, trying to change of the nations, using the arm of law, using legislation, trying to change agendas for personal benefit. In, in this season, we've seen a lot around capture, state capture. What is that? State capture is talking about corrupt political individuals, and we know about state capture in South Africa. It's around corrupt political individuals or entities that are attempting to influence a state's decision-making processes what? For their own benefit for their own benefit. And so we're seeing this play itself out. And state capture um, is, is enabled by the media to a great extent. They use, just like legislation is used, media is also used to advance a certain type of thinking. And so the media needs to make a decision to say, whose side are we on? What are we representing? What are we here for? The information war. So what is the information war? A war of lots of information. We're living in an information technology. This is the season and dispensation we're in. Lots of news out there. A lot of the news is fake news. I'm sure you know that. So many fake news. So we've got a, a lot of, of, of fake news, false narratives, because people understand the system of the world understands Romans 12 too, maybe even better than we do. 
Because they understand that the mind, be ye transformed, why? But by the renewal of your mind. So the media is one of the greatest tools that you can use to actually renew the mind. But the question is, how are you renewing the mind? Fake news can renew the mind as well, but in a negative way. And so our responsibility as the media then is to make sure that there is no false narratives. We need to correct false, fake narratives. It's interesting because, you know, when this fake news started coming out a lot on different aspects, issues of vaccinations and all of that, I used to go to uh, fact checkers. In fact, you know, last two, three years, I would go into all the websites and check, is this information correct? Until I found out that the fact che checkers, most of them are fake too. <laughs> That's right, they're on the payroll. So after checking, 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 I was wondering, and then, you know, they would fact check me, especially on Facebook, and say, I'm like, wait a minute, I did my research, this is not fake. So I realized that fact checkers also were fake. They themselves were fake. So you can't even rely on the fact checkers, because they are, as has been said, on the payroll. They're out there to also create another narrative. So they, they have a narrative that they want to support. And it's important that we understand that from the very beginning. Because there's a narrative that we must support. And later on we'll talk about what that narrative, what guides that narrative. The narrative that we must represent. What are the guiding principles for that narrative? So even the fact checkers are fake. They're false. And as we said, the media plays a critical role in determining the outcome of this battle, in determining how our minds, how we think, the media is critical in this battle, in this information war, in this whole issue. Because as we've said there, you've seen that we've talked about that. Romans 12 too. Whoever controls the media will influence the minds and the hearts of the people and the agendas of the nations. So how do we do that? How do we control and look at the at the different aspects. So, uh, tell me, what do you see when you see that? What comes to mind? Beauty pageant. Beauty pageant. Yeah, do we agree, beauty pageant? Yeah. So if you look at that, you would think, looking at that, that that's a beauty pageant. Well, the, the truth of the matter is these are um, graduates, Ethiopian graduates from a medical school. All these women here, they've just graduated from medical school. Yeah, these are all female medical doctors, recently graduated. <laughs> Looking at it, it looks like a beauty pageant. But these are all African, female. It's a narrative what we don't hear very often. First of all, we don't think there are many medical students out there. So it's, it's a narrative that is out there, but it's not being told. Here's another narrative. Also another narrative about Africa. The first one was about Africa. So is this one about Africa. There now we see what? We see poverty, we see slums, we see, you know, the proverbial African child who you will see with a distended belly and flies circling. It tells another narrative of Africa. The poverty, the famine, etc., represents one narrative of Africa. So I'm just trying to put out there that there are narratives that we can tell. Some narratives are being told about Africa, others are not being told. I'm just laying down the foundation for you that there is a narrative. And our responsibility is to, is to present the real narrative, is to present the hidden narratives. Because part of the reason why you would see people wanting to represent Africa only as this is where there is an agenda to control Africa, to take over her resources. So you have to present her as a nothing and a nobody. Well, if Africa is so impoverished and poor, why is everybody trying to colonize her? <laughs> why will you come to a continent consistently where there's nothing? So it suits people to make a certain narrative of Africa so that they can begin to loot the resources 
It suits them to say Africa is a place of war. What they don't tell you is that they create the wars so that while the people are warring, they're looting the resources. DRC has been in war for how long? 30 or more years. Why? Because DRC happens to be the single most wealthy nation in Africa. It has every single mineral that you can think of. Whether it's plutonium or whatever, DRC single-handedly is loaded. So it's, it, 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 it suits people to create wars so that they can loot the nations out there. So, like I said, I wanted to lay a foundation around narratives. Two narratives out there. One that is popularly known by the whole world. Everybody knows this narrative. Why? Because CNN has sold this narrative. BBC sells this narrative. And the challenge is if Africa doesn't tell her own story, other people will tell you a story. And I'm saying to you, as media people, if we don't tell our stories, other people will tell our stories. And it will be a story that will benefit their agenda. It will be a story that benefits the, 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 the purpose the purpose that they have, their, their hidden purposes. So I just wanted to show you two different narratives. One narrative is widely known by the whole world, which is misrepresentative, actually, of the true Africa. The other narrative is not known at all. Many other people would have thought, oh, that's a beauty pageant. Probably in the United States, they would have probably even said, beauty pageant somewhere in the US. Because nowhere would they have said that, oh, African women are, are beautiful or anything like that. No, they'll present some, some other picture and narrative to sell their story. So, the narrative. What is the narrative we must tell? We must tell a new narrative. We must tell a new narrative. There are narratives that have been sold out there that are not correct, that are not true. And I'm challenging us here as people in the media, mountain media gate, whatever you want to talk about, media sphere, I'm challenging us to say it's time, get that ball. It's time to tell a new narrative. It's time to tell a new narrative. Isaiah 43, 18 says, forgetting the former things, forgetting the past, but moving into a new thing. God says in Isaiah 43, 19, see, see. See, behold, see. My prayer is that God will open up the eyes of our understanding to see, to see that new narrative, to see those new stories, to see the, the, the potential of Africa. See, may God open up the eyes of our understanding to see. He said, see, behold, see, and then take a hold of and become, behold. See, behold, I will do a new thing. I will do a new thing. And then God talks about taking us out of a wilderness. And then he says streams and springs will flow out of that place. I'm challenging us as people in the media game to say, let us see the new narrative. Let us see with God's eyes. Let us see the stories that have not been told. And let us tell them. Let us bring them out there. It's time to tell a new narrative. I wish actually, because I need y'all to, to, to participate with me. I need you to tell your neighbor, just say, it's time, get not go. It's time, tell him it's time, get not go. Time for a new narrative. Tell him it's time for a new narrative. Time for a new narrative. Time for a new narrative. We can't just be talking about all the shady stuff that other nations want to believe about us. Oh, South Africa is finished. South Africa is this. No, we need to tell our own story, South Africa. We need to tell our own narrative. We need to bring out our own stories. We cannot allow other nations to begin to tell our own narrative. It's time. It's time for a new narrative. And that narrative must not only be new, it must be a truthful one. A truthful one is the truth that sets free. Is it no wonder that there's so many captives out there? It's the truth that sets free. Truth sets free. And so, in our, our uh, quest to tell a new narrative, let's make sure that we are telling the truth. We are telling that narrative that is rooted in truth. That is rooted in, 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 in no lies. No, no, we've done our research well. We've prepared, we've, we've checked our notes. 
we, we, we made sure that this is a truthful narrative. That must be our guiding and foundational principle of not compromising the truth, even if it means that the truth is not what other people want to hear. Are we prepared to, 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 be, to be, you know, um, insulted? I've, I've got to that point where I'm just like, you know what? Regardless of what, regardless of whether I'm, I'm, I'm challenged, regardless of whether I'm insulted, I've come to the place where I said, even if I go to prison for telling the truth, I'm ready. I'm ready, I don't know about you. But the truth cannot be compromised. I keep telling people, I said, even if I go to prison, I said, listen, uh, orange will look good, looks good on me anyway. I'm good. Orange is my color. So, give me an opportunity to minister to those behind the bars and to worship my way out. That's right. Go right through. That's right. That's how they did it in the olden days. Worship your way out. So the truth, the narrative must be a new one. It must be a, a, a. We, we have to paint the picture of nations that are, are aligned to their redemptive purpose. In this season, I believe strongly from a prophetic perspective that God wants to do a new work in Africa. That Africa will not no longer be walking and positioned as a begging bowl, but as a bread basket to the nations. That's, the, that's the, 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 the narrative that we must spell out. The beauty of Africa, the prophetic destiny of Africa, that God will use Africa to be a breadbasket to the nations. When nations are eating genetically modified foods, when nations are eating all sorts of foods, ah, Africa is beginning to feed other nations because we own 60% of the world's total land that has not been cultivated. We have an opportunity to feed the nations on organic food and not genetically modified foods. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To be that bread basket. That's the narrative. The narratives we must pull out around how unique we are, around how blessed we are in terms of resources, around our culture, around our Ubuntu. That's the narrative we must tell. That's the narrative we must tell. It's interesting. When we look at democracy, the free and independent media is one of the pillars of democracy. How free and independent are we? A, a, a media that's been compromised. On, if we look at our television stations, how many are actually free and independent? And how many are actually working for specific organizations? It's a challenge. It's a challenge I raised even with our judiciary recently. I said, we need to interrogate and investigate. Is our judiciary really free and independent? When the judiciary is being paid and appointed by a certain arm of government, how free and independent is that? Whoever pays the piper calls the tune. So it's no wonder that certain judgments are going a certain way. How am I going to bite the hand of the one who has appointed me and feeds me? So we're beginning to call out some judges. Because I've been in that position and I've seen some terrible judgments. And I'm wondering, what law school did you go to? So we're calling them out. We're saying, on what basis did you make this judgment? We're reporting you to the Judicial Services Commission. Because you were compromised. You were judicially captured. So democracy, we have to. We have to stand up as that media that is not compromised because government is paying our salary. Or whoever it is that may be paying your salary. It is a tenant of democracy, a free and independent media. It is a tenant. So when you bought up all the media channels and media arms, how free and independent will they be? And so as a, as a Christian media, we, we have to articulate, we have to demonstrate what a media looks like when it's free and when it's independent. It has the ability to tell the truth. It has the ability to, to do research and to tell an uncompromised truth, whether anybody likes it or not. 
That's what free and independent media looks like. This is what God wants to do here in our midst. To demonstrate what a free media looks like, what an independent media looks like, what a truthful media looks like. That's what I believe God wants to do in and through us in this time. I, I learned recently that the Australian media, some of the Australian media, were offered tax-free benefits. So these are some of the shenanigans that will go on to make sure that a certain narrative is told. I pray that nobody here will go, you know, God said in um, Matthew 6, 24, he said, you either serve me or you serve my mom. But you can't serve both of us. Mammon is the spirit behind money. And he said, the love of money is the root of all evil. So, money can take you off of track. Tax-free benefits can take you off of track where you're now representing a narrative that suits a particular position and doesn't represent the truth. I pray, my prayer for you as a media and a media gate is that you will have the courage, you will have the courage to, to tell the truth. Right now that's an opportunity for you to tell your neighbor, say take courage, take courage. Tell your neighbor, take courage. Grah. My Afrikaans is not so good, but I know, I know. Grah. Yeah. Grah, Grah is my. Grah is my. Power is mighty. Power is mighty, yeah. Let's have some Grah. <laughs> have some Grah. Have courage, have strength to tell the truth. To tell the truth. You know, when people swear you in the court, they say, Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth? nothing but the truth. So help me God. May God help you to tell the truth Amen. and to not compromise those standards. The narrative. It's a new narrative. It's a truthful narrative. It's a free and independent narrative. A narrative that's told by free and independent media that have not been captured. It's a narrative that requires courage. Other side of narrative. It's an empowering narrative. Let that narrative go out there. Do you know how much fear is out there? Everybody's, you know, oops, scared. Ooh. <laughs> Everybody's so scared out there. Why? Because the media is releasing fear. Much of the media out there. Oh, this is going to happen. I keep telling people that, you know, I, I really believe that fear is an entrance. It's a doorway. When you, God says, God is not giving you a spirit of fear. So if God hasn't given it to you, where is it coming from? So when you allow the enemy to give you a spirit of fear, that's what's killing a lot of people with COVID. COVID, quote. So once you allow fear, fear cannot be something that's allowed to rule our nation. It doesn't come from God. So that means we must counter. We must counter that, that narrative of fear. How do we do that? We counter it by giving hope. Christ the hope of glory. We counter it by presenting, you know, optimism, by pre releasing hope. Uh, one of my friends, Jarrett, I'm sure you've seen those, those posters out there how day. Hashtag I'm staying. Yes. yes, that's Jarrett out there trying to bring hope. That there is hope. Not just bringing a dismal and, and, and absolutely nothing to hope for. That we must bring forth. Christ is the hope of glory. So if we are believers of Yeshua, we must present a narrative that carries hope within it. It carries hope within it. Talking about I am the story group. I am the story is a is a group that I joined a few years ago also. Um, some of my friends, Daryl Hardy. I'm sure you see those billboards out there with Christian messages. On the Jahannam, yeah. Pardon? Daryl Yes, Daryl to love. That's Daryl. Daryl Hardy. Yeah. So Daryl. So we put. We decided. We came together. We said we have to tell a new narrative. It can, it can't just be doom and gloom. Let's prophesy over our nation. Amen. Let's make prophetic declarations. The power of life and death is in the tongue. Let's prophesy life over South Africa. And so you would have seen those billboards. 
shouldn't just be billboards. Everywhere. We put signs that our, um, Rochelle, and she was supposed to be here, but she's, I don't see her. But she was going to, um, she helps put, put messages of hope in the taxis. While you're looking at the taxis and the Ubers and everything, you'll see messages of hope. Messages of hope. Let's release that. Let's release that hope. Giving good news. Proverbs 18, 21, we know that scripture. The power of, of life and death. Giving news, good news out there. An empowering narrative by promoting transparency over secrecy. There's so many secret things out there. We must promote transparency. Why are things being hidden? hidden? Why are things underground? That's what's empowering. Giving people news. Giving people real news. Giving people hopeful news. All of that is empowering. That brings us to a place where we can empower people. Empower them by giving them facts and not fiction. Empower them not by filling them with fear and dread, but with hope. And empowering them mostly of all. We had this conversation earlier on. And I say, righteousness and justice must be a benchmark. Amen. Righteousness and justice. Psalms 97 too says that righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So our, our media, our news, our information must be undergirded by righteousness and justice. Protecting hard-fought constitutional rights such as freedom of religion. So the stories about hate speech must be stories that you are telling. What is the agenda behind the hate speech? What is that agenda? So if people out there are trying to label certain sections of the Bible as hate speech, then that news must come out. It must come out. The Babuda Bill trying to label certain aspects of the Bible. Right now we have cases. I'm sure, I don't know if Danielle has been here yet representing 4SA. But I'm sure she would have spoken to you a lot about some of the cases out there. It is our responsibility as the media to let those stories out. Cases such as, you know, a, a Christian evangelist being sued because he said Jesus is the way, the only way. <coughs> being sued. He said, oh, that's discrimination. You're saying I'm not going to heaven because I'm not, I'm not a Christian. Those stories must be told. We need you to help us tell those stories, to push back on, on the attempt to silence the church. And there's a deliberate attack on the church, not on any, just any faith, but on the church in particular. That's why the CRL, I confronted the CRL, the Commission on Religion and Linguistics. I said, why are you attacking the Christians only? Your job actually is to look at aspects of culture. And I said to them, I said, your mandate, you've exceeded your mandate. You're just focusing on the Christian church. But people are dying every year because of cultural practices. Hmm? The young boys who are dying because of, of, of illegal circumcision, right? That's your job. What have you done about it? Hmm? What have you done in CRL? I said, please, open letter to CRL. Why are you focused on the church? You've got a, a mandate here. Hmm? You've got young ladies who are being hijacked into marriage. What it, that's your job, CRL. What have you done? <laughs> because the focus is the church. To silence that, that, that benchmark, that morality benchmark, so that it would leave a door open for uh, unlicensed evil and wickedness and, and all of that. If the church is removed, gotten out of the way, we can do anything we want. If the church is silenced, we can do anything we want. So, using, empowering, using righteousness and justice standards, protecting hard-fought constitutional rights, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. One of the things that people have widely misunderstood on this issue around mandatory vaccination, it's not an issue of mandatory vaccination. It's an issue of protecting your right to choose. This is what we are protecting. 
So, I, you know, I say this so people will not feel condemned. Well, I vaccinated. It's not really about whether you vaccinated. It's about choosing, protecting your right to choose, which is constitutionally protected. It's, it's, it's in the Constitution. Section 15 of the Constitution talks about right to dignity. But the courts of South Africa have said that right to dignity includes a right to choose because you cannot separate them. They are inextricably intertwined. They're like twins. You cannot say somebody has a right to dignity if they do not have a right to choose. So if I do not have a right to choose what goes into my body, that is an infringement of my right to bodily integrity, physiological integrity, and psychological integrity. And what people don't realize, who are getting into this really battle of, it's not a vaccination against vaccination. It means once this right to choose has been taken away, today is vaccination, tomorrow is something else. Yeah. Once that precedent is set, it's set for life in every aspect of your life, not just for vaccination. Yeah. That's what we're fighting for. Your right to choose. Fighting for equality against discrimination. Who knows better than we as South Africans around issues of, of, of discrimination? We do. So you can't discriminate against two groups of people. One group can get COVID and transmit COVID, but so can the other group. Both the vaccinated and vaccinated. Didn't our president get COVID? Wasn't he supposed to be vaccinated? And then? So if we both can get COVID and transmit it, why will you now discriminate against one group? These are against the fundamental principles of law. The Employment Equity Act prohibits that. Section 9 of our Constitution prohibits unfair discrimination. We are fighting for your constitutional rights. These are the stories that must be told. Protecting hard for constitutional rights. So, um, this is my last slide, just to say this, that we cannot successfully take the media gate without actually owning it. Many of us are working from media houses, and I want to put to you that instead of just working as employees, we need to actually own the media houses. We need to start our own media houses. We need to own them. We need to be those ones who can actually uh, uh, be owning. Because when you are an employee, sometimes you are constricted in terms of what you must write. You are told what you have to write. So my challenge to us here is, you know, create our own News 24. That's right. Nothing is impossible with God. Amen. Why can't there's one media house that's owned literally by one or two people? I pray that God will raise you up here to begin to create your own media uh, 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 group as a group. Create your own media group because you will always be compromised if you're working for other people. Psalms 24 1 The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it thereof. God owns everything. He's able to resource. He's able to resource. That those new media houses, the creation of new media houses. Create new ones. If we can't buy the existing ones, then create new ones. Start your own. Start your own magazines out there. Use technology to make your own platforms. You may say, maybe I don't have the, the, the resources. Listen, you can create your own platforms right now for free. For free. Use that technology creatively to make sure that the stories go out there. I don't have a media house, but I have 45,000 friends on Facebook. I make sure I tell the stories. <laughs> I do. 45,000 groups. We shall hashtag. We shall not be silent. I send them out there. Hey, have you heard? Blah, 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 blah. Boom. <laughs> they go out. Woo. What's up to my, my greatest advantage? That's right. You know, somebody asked me once not too long ago, they said, um, oh, they wanted to talk to my PA. I said, oh, can we talk to I said, no, I am my PA. <laughs> my PA, my driver, I'm everything. They said, 
What do you mean I said I have no staff? I'm just, it's me. I'm the whole, I'm the whole office. <laughs> Somebody said, oh my God, I thought you were like Joyce Meyer or something with this huge ministry of staff. I said, I know how to use social media to create that impression. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. You think there's a lot of me, there's only one. <laughs> Meyer, you're just a little Tuana girl from South Africa. <laughs> Not even a PA. Not a T girl, just Ahoy, Ahoy, what's up? Ahoy, the telegram. Ahoy, the signal. Ahoy, the Facebook. Ahoy, the LinkedIn. TikTok. No, I just got on TikTok. My daughter just taught me, so I'll be doing TikTok very soon. Yeah. Watch, watch this face. <laughs> getting out there, getting out there. Let's make sure we, we get on those stations, the radio stations, the TV stations, and get into the mainstream as well, not just Christian platforms. Get out there in the mainstream. Not too long ago, I did an interview on carte blanche, and everybody was telling me, don't do it. No, you can't. Carte blanche, they're going to twist everything, and they're going to make you look bad. And blah 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 blah. Hine hine hine. Wada wada wada. Be better be better be better. And I said, you know what? I don't mind because of my reputation. And my reputation means nothing. Yeshua made himself of no reputation to come here. But I said it's an opportunity to get into the mainstream and to tell a story. I'm going to take that opportunity. And God was faithful. Took that video and made it out there go viral. That video. So see how to get into the mainstream as much as possible. That is our reasonable uh, um, service to God. But my prayer for you is that God will use you in this season to take the media gate, to go out there, that you will have the courage to go and take that gate unapologetically, to tell a narrative, a new narrative, to tell a truthful narrative, an uncompromised narrative, an empowering narrative that does not carry fear, but one that is rooted in righteousness and justice and will begin to liberate God's people. God richly bless you. I love you with a lot of love.